candidate at, the, at UC Davis. Uh, I'm in my fourth year here in the Transportation Technology and Policy Program. Uh, my focus is on innovation uh, uh, processes and the strategies for affecting the growth of markets for next generation uh, vehicle technologies such as plug-in vehicles and fuel cells. Um, I'm also the lead researcher of the Plug-in Electric Vehicle Dealership Study, which was funded by the California Energy Commission and uh, uh, conducted in partnership with the California New Car Dealers Association, as well as uh, J.D. Power & Associates and the Center for Sustainable Energy. Um, I invite you, if you want to learn a little bit more about my background, I'd invite you to take a look at my profile either on the link that you received by email or on LinkedIn, uh, where you can see the full, uh, full profile. Uh, with that, I'll move on here and get us started since there's a lot to cover on this subject. Um, and that's because there isn't a whole lot of uh, literature or information available to policymakers on this subject and hence the reason for the research. So what are the main questions that the research is trying to answer? First of all, we want to understand is the retail experience better, worse, the same for plug-in electric vehicle buyers? Um, and do, you know, secondly, uh, does the way that automakers introduce these, uh, these vehicles to the public uh, result in better, worse, same results or performance? Uh, we then want to understand what barriers and drivers appear to affect this, this performance and engagement in plug-in vehicle sales, and finally, to see if there's any opportunities for policy. We used a multi-method research approach, which included extensive literature reviews across a number of disciplines in the uh, management science and policy literatures, uh, as well as exploratory interviews with uh, early buyers, as well as with dealer owners and salespeople and dealers throughout at dealerships throughout California. Uh, we obtained survey data from J.D. Power, uh, the 2013 Sales Satisfaction Index Study, which includes over 29,000 responses. Uh, it's a random uh, sample uh, survey of new car buyers in, uh, in the United States. And we also had information uh, uh, from California Clean Vehicle Rebate Program uh, survey from, uh, as you can see, the dates there, which consisted of about 3,000 survey responses from, from buyers of plug-in vehicles who uh, submitted for the rebate, uh, the state rebate here in California. Um, we also conducted extensive interviews in the four core markets here in California for plug-in vehicles. Uh, that, that included uh, San Francisco, Sacramento uh, area, as well as Los Angeles and the San Diego greater uh, metro areas. Uh, this included a total of 63 interviews, which uh, involved 21 new car dealers, six automakers, and five utilities. It also included 20 site visits and 38 on-site dealer interviews. So fairly extensive. So I'll launch right into some of the, you know, the initial examination of the data, which showed that there was a clear gap here in overall retail satisfaction from plug -in, uh, between plug-in buyers and conventional vehicle buyers. Uh, and this is for your non-premium or mass market types of, of vehicles, your know, makes of vehicles, which would include your uh, Ford, GMs, Honda, Toyota, those type of vehicles. And uh, as you can see, the gap is significant. Those black bars indicate the, um, uh, the margin of error, basically, a standard error here. And um, so this is, by industry standards, a fairly large gap. Anytime you introduce a new technology to dealers, you're going to have some, you typically will have some kind of a gap, but this is a pretty large one. And the other thing to bear in mind with these scores is they may not look all that terrible here. You know, a 7.5, say, to an 8 is still a fairly high rating. Uh, but bear in mind that this included only buyers and not the actual rejectors of the dealer and or the manufacturer. So these numbers in actuality are very conservative and would be much lower in reality when you include the uh, uh, rejectors in the study. We were unable to do that uh, because of the fact that we couldn't trace directly to whether the buyer intended to, uh, to buy a plug-in vehicle versus a, um, a uh, conventional vehicle. So just a little bit of background before moving on to delving into you know, what might be the sources of those, uh, the sources, uh, sources of some of those gaps. First of all, um, Automakers don't own their dealer networks. They uh, use a franchise system, 
of in independently owned and operated dealers throughout the country, and there's over 17,000 of them. Um, those dealers buy those cars from the automaker, and they stock them with credit um, that, they, uh, that they get from the banks, and then they turn around and sell those to end customers. And uh, this, has been the way it, uh, this has been the way of the industry for a very long time, uh, well over half a century. Uh, they, the benefit to customers is that dealers provide localized service, warranty, and repair support. They also facilitate trade-ins and consumer uh, credit availability. And these are very complex transactions. Certainly, uh, if you consider before the Internet age, uh, these pretty much involved having to be one-to-one -one physically with a customer. Uh, the dealers gain from, or sorry, the automakers gain from using dealers because it gets them access, uh, broader access and deeper access to the markets throughout the U.S. And you have to bear in mind that this is now, uh, as of really the late 40s and 50s uh, of last century, a mature market in which we have pretty well institutionalized products. People know what these are. They know how to use them. They've been using them for decades. They haven't changed all that much. They still have a steering wheel, four wheels, brake, you know, uh, and an accelerator. <laughs> so uh, consequently, uh, using dealers uh, was the best way to go about doing this and, and to reach uh, as many people as possible, customers as possible in a saturated market. Um, and to bear, you know, to, to that end, dealers are optimized uh, even today to, to fulfill existing demand. They are um, they're there to facilitate the sale by and large. They're not there necessarily to stoke demand. So that brings us to an important element of the landscape when we're talking about incenting uh, the purchase of alternative vehicles or advanced vehicles. Um, and that is dependency and power in this relationship. And this has been uh, you know, a, contentious, a contentious area for a long time, uh, certainly in the early decades, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, when um, their automakers, well, let, let me back up a little bit, uh, dealers sell, typically have an exclusive territory. That's a fran they're a franchise business, they have exclusive territory and a contract, it's a contractually binding legal agreement with an automaker to sell only that automaker's products. And consequently, those dealers are fully dependent on that automaker to supply that. And that places them at a distinct disadvantage in terms of, say, a power standpoint. Um, in other words, if the automaker decides to do something like, um, you know, try to unload a bunch of cars that they're not selling and nobody wants, the dealers could be left stuck with them. And consequently, um, in the middle of the last century, a number of laws were passed. The dealers um, militated uh, and organized through their trade associations to influence government to pass a number of laws that protect dealers from these uh, unfair practices. And uh, that is a relationship that has um, solidified over many decades. And consequently, even to this day, uh, this is a very legally sensitive area, and there's an, uh, consequently an arm's length relationship between OEMs and dealers. Very clear boundaries in terms of what the OEM and OSO, let me clarify OEM, that means an automaker, an original equipment manufacturer, and the dealers who sell their products. So uh, automakers cannot directly tell a dealer what, what to sell, and they can't tell them how to sell it. They can influence um, indirectly what the dealer sells and how they sell it. And they do that through a number of carrots, and mostly carrots, not, not so many sticks, because again, of the, the legal ramifications of that. Uh, so it's largely financial. And the automakers also um, use satisfaction, sales and satisfaction metrics to monitor the desired behavior of dealers. And then they reward those dealers who meet performance goals. So, what does that mean for plug-in vehicles? Well, first of all, plug-ins are, and I made the case, making the case here, the argument that plug-ins are more like high-tech products. And that is, the reason for this is because, uh, there are several reasons. One, they change uh, customer behavior. They involve changes in customer behavior. Uh, so, for example, you know, people have to plug in uh, in order to charge the car. There's very different be you know, behaviors uh, from, say, a gas pump. It takes a lot longer to charge the car. Uh, you're charging, sometimes you're charging the car at your home 
which is a very different use case, a very different uh, context uh, in which to use that product, and it requires just an uh, understanding of different equipment. Uh, and the customer is relying on new infrastructure that doesn't currently exist or exists in a very small amount and is, a, is evolving um, as we speak. So consequently, there's high uncertainty in the purchase decision. Uh, and that is what is fundamentally different from traditional products and traditional automotive products. And consequently, that creates a split between the early and the mainstream market. In the early market, you generally, we call these typically early adopters, they tend to fit a different profile. They generally are, are less risk averse, they're more willing to take chances, they're generally more affluent and educated, and they want to be the first person on the block to own the latest and greatest. And some of that is status-based. You know, they, they want to be able to brag about the, the technology, and some of it is value-based. And consequently, that's very different from the way a mainstream market customer might evaluate a product decision. Um, you know, they tend to be more pragmatic about it. It tends to be more of an economic driver. Is this going to save me money? Uh, is this going to meet the needs of my family? And consequently, you've got, in a way, two different markets as opposed to one uniform market in that sense. So for automakers and for anybody introducing, any firm introducing a, a technology that what we would, we would refer to it as, as us, us academics would call it discontinuous type of technology which has these, um, these elements to it, uh, the, the competency that you need to sell these, these types of products is different. In the early market, you want to create demand and you want to discover the end-to-end -end needs of customers because the customers, as we mentioned, are going to be relying on a end-to-end -end support network. Um, and that is important to discover those needs and ensure that the distribution channel is able to meet those needs prior to going into the mainstream market uh, and delivering, in which case you want to be able to deliver a seamless end-to-end -end experience in which the pragmatists, the people who think of this from an economic standpoint, don't have to second guess this decision. Uh, they know that they'll be covered. Uh, and that means selecting an optimal distribution channel. And historically, the niche approach has been uh, extremely effective in this way. And, and most people can think of you know, the, the best analogy of that is Apple uh, and the way that they've uh, uh, brought products to market. Again, you think of the Apple as being a very different platform and consequently they needed to provide a learning environment for consumers. Um, it may also involve a transition strategy because it's not just about creating demand and discovering the end-to-end -end needs, but also being able, being able to have access to the mainstream customers. And this is actually something that automakers have in abundance. Um, what they have less of is the competence to build an early market. And consequently, you need a transition strategy. Well, you need a strategy to hit both early market and main market and a transi transition strategy to cross the chasm, so to speak, or bridge that gap. And this requires competency building by channel partners. So what we're fundamentally talking about here is learning. So this is uh, something called the contingency view of high technology marketing. And what this is uh, basically saying is that given the innovation, contingent upon the innovation type, you want a introduction strategy appropriately matched to that innovation type in order to succeed with your new product, in order to have a higher performing uh, you know, innovation experience. And that involves developing a number of competencies. So this is the, uh, the research model which underpins uh, much of the uh, analysis that, uh, that I conducted. And this starts with a number of research questions. Uh, you know, it is Basically, you know, do we see performance being uh, better or worse depending on the type of innovation? And in this case, we use the uh, ICE stands for internal combustion engine versus the, uh, you know, the versus a discontinuous type of technology, which in this case is a plug-in electric vehicle. Um, and then we compare that with the introduction strategy that is being used by the automaker to bring it to market. Uh, so there's either a mass market strategy or an innovation-specific strategy, which, uh, as I alluded to earlier, is the niche market strategy. Um, so, and then we're going to, take a, going to take a look at performance, both from uh, a subjective standpoint, based on the interview data, as well as the, obje as the objective data, 
that, uh, that we have from surveys. And we use predominantly retail satisfaction as the performance criteria, and that, that helps us understand the quality of the retail experience. So when we do that, what we see here, and I've broken this up, uh, and, and I'll allow you a little bit of time to uh, digest this, but the, the orange color there, the orange bar, is a conventional vehicle buyer representing the non-premium non makes. So these are your mass market makes that I mentioned earlier. Uh, the blue bar is the non-premium plug-in vehicle buyer. As you can see, you already, uh, I already showed this graph a little earlier, and you can see that gap. Now when we look at the premium makes, uh, we can see that the conventional vehicle buyer is, is definitely much higher than the non-premium make for conventional vehicle buyers. But also, strikingly, what we see is that the premium uh, plug-in vehicle buyer scores much higher than any of the other buyer segments. And of course, in 2013, the only data point we really have for this is Tesla Motors. There are other premium makes now with BMW and uh, even GM with their Cadillac uh, brand has come to the market with their own. We do not have that data in here since this is 2013, and I, it would, I would certainly invite a retesting of this with, with 2014 and uh, eventually 2015 data to see how this moves uh, evolves over time. So in our interviews, we found that to many dealers, PEVs are just a hassle. Um, they have to know more. Uh, it's unfamiliar topic areas that they've never had to know before in the past, right? So things like electricity rates. I mean, this, this is not something they understand or have ever had to understand uh, in their local market. Uh, you know, other examples include the uh, equipment, the charging equipment. Uh, the pl public incentives that come along when you sell a plug-in vehicle. We have all these different and, and many fragmented um, uh, incentives available. So when you think of things like HOV lane stickers or state rebates or the federal tax credits, these all are kind of like silos in and of, of themselves that have different processes. And um, consequently, it, it's just a lot for the dealer to handle. On top of that, uh, turnover in this industry is really high, on the order of 50 to 100 percent a year in their sales staff. So in other words, every year or two, a dealer, typical dealership is turning over their sales force, in, entirely turning over their sales force. So what becomes a concern here is longevity of this, and this involves a disproportionately large investment for many dealers, where PEVs may represent a small fraction, you know, 2 percent, 5 percent of their total sales. But they're having to invest a rather large amount of money in order to train salespeople that are ultimately going to leave uh, within a year or two. They also, uh, one thing we've heard a lot of is that it's a longer sales cycle. These customers need more hand-holding. They have to develop a, a relationship with them. Usually it starts with an email or chat online or by phone. Uh, and then they kind of have to, you know, uh, handle that relationship to get them to come into their dealership and bring them into the dealership. And when, once they do, they, we often heard that there's longer transaction and longer delivery times. So there's some quotes here. You know, we, we often heard this, hey, it's, we heard everything from it's from 10 minutes longer to it's, it's twice or an, over an hour longer. Uh, so there, there's quite a spectrum of perception here. The other thing we heard a lot of is questionable profits and, and really kind of meager salesperson take. They're not making big money on these cars. Um, many dealers, many of the salespeople make what's called uh, the mini, which is just kind of a flat $150 or $200 uh, bonus every time they sell one of these cars. Some automakers, uh, and I should say this varies greatly from automaker to automaker. Um, some automakers have gone to some great lengths to incent their sent their dealers and their salespeople to sell these cars, offering, you know, a higher spiff is what it's called, that bonus, uh, giving them, you know, bumping their percentage of commission up, for example, uh, if they sell a certain amount of, of plug-in vehicles. But what we did find is that those are cyclical. It depends on whether the automaker is trying to unload a lot of these vehicles or if they're tr they have other kind of internal justifications for selling these cars, and consequently, there isn't a whole lot of momentum that's established. And that's an important uh, learning that we took away, is that momentum for these dealers is important because this is, as I mentioned earlier, about learning. And, and 
with learning comes retention. So if you're not, if you're only seeing, if you're only selling one or two of these cars a month, or even even three or four, or say five a month, uh, it's hard to remember that information again the next time you sell it. And for automakers, con competence and confidence, sorry, for dealers, competence and confidence is very closely tied. So if they feel that they're competent in selling the car, which comes with greater frequency, they're more confident that they can sell more of them and more likely to go seek it. So that's one side of the coin. On the other side of the coin, we talked to a lot of dealers who saw PEVs as an opportunity. They saw, it as elect they saw electrification as a long-term trend in the industry, and they see an opportunity for plug-in vehicles to align with their branding strategy. And, and often that strategy involves being you know, green, being environmentally attuned to the customer and wanting to draw customers in based on them being an environmental leader. Many of them might be uh, LEED certified um, in terms of their facilities. And in fact, we know of at least one automaker that uh, that bases training off of, or, or bases, um, has an entire program around LEED for not only plug-in vehicles, but for conventional vehicles as well. And they recognize this as a strategic opportunity to win new customers, grow market share, draw customers from other dealer territories, and ultimately increase sales turns. And this is because uh, they see a lot of leases. Here in California, something like 62% of the sales are, are by lease. Um, and this makes a lot of sense, since a lot of the incentives uh, are maxed out when a, when a customer leases the car. Um, we also uh, noticed that these dealerships typically had an executive level product champion. You know, either it was the uh, dealer principal, like an owner or, or general manager, uh, or, you know, and or they were near affluent communities and HOV lanes. And they also typically had a, te a tech savvy salesperson. And, uh, and that made, that tech savvy salesperson was usually going to designate it as a, uh, as a specialist in, in plugins, and I'll, I'll hit that in just a bit. Um, so this is another thing we delved into. We took a closer look at the purchase transaction to see if perceptions matched reality. And again, again this is average. These are average times, and I'll take a moment because I know this is a bit of a busy chart uh, for the audience here to digest it. But what you want to look at is the, the full bar length, and on the bottom is the total time it takes for a customer to buy a car once they come into the dealership, once they step on the lot, and once they leave with the car, drive off the lot with the car. And the, the little, you know, the, the sub bars here, the blue, the red, the green, are the different stages that they go through. So first they select the vehicle, that's the blue bar, then they uh, negotiate their deal, and then that's the red bar, then they wait. Then they have they have to wait for finance and insurance to be available. Then they go into the office and do finance and insurance. Then there's a wait before taking delivery. And as you can see, uh, the total time is typically around four hours. The industry average is, is over four hours in the dealership. Uh, we looked at the plug-in vehicle buyer experience, and as you, it's clear here, the plug-in buyer is actually getting out sooner, not by much. So it's pretty much the, it's pretty close. The asterisks you're seeing are the statistically significant differences from the conventional buyer. So we can see that the wait time seems to be a little shorter for plug-in buyers. We can see that the uh, uh, that taking delivery is just a, a, a fraction longer. On the premium side, uh, you can there, there's a big difference, right? Because what we're looking at here is basically Tesla versus all of the premium brands, the luxury brands. Those include your you know Mercedes-Benz, your BMWs. And, and the like, Cadillacs and the like. So uh, big differences here, right? A lot of this is facilitated online. You'll notice also a big takeaway here is that Tesla spends between two-thirds and a quarter more time with buyers at delivery than dealers of, uh, of any kind. Uh, there's also, you can see here, shorter upstream processes. And we, we think that that means Tesla buyers may be more receptive to extra time and attention at the delivery uh, point point of delivery. Uh, we notice that when people are at a dealership for three or four hours, the delivery aspect of this, uh, people are not real keen to stick around any longer. They pretty much want to get home with their car. So they're not really receptive to uh, you know, going in depth on how to use the car and, and this and that. Now, 
Now, one thing to bear in mind is Tesla's uh, a bit more of a complicated car, so it does need more time to go through that, that stack, for the center stack, for example. But I think it's also emblematic that you've got a fundamentally different technology here, and consequently it, it needs that time. We also noticed that the delivery process may matter more to plug-in buyers. Um, plug premium buyers, premium plug-in buyers rate retailers much higher when considering explanation of vehicle features at delivery. And they're generally more forgiving on overall score when they're less satisfied with that, uh, with that delivery. So earlier we talked about those dealers that uh, were kind of on the forefront here, the pioneers, if you will, let's call them dealer innovators that implement new approaches. And some of the things we saw in the, with these dealers is that, as a, and I know I mentioned this earlier, they designate seasoned PEV specialists. So these aren't those first year salespeople who might be out the door in less than a year. These are, these are salespeople who have been around for two or three years, maybe more. Uh, so they've already kind of uh, passed muster and will likely stick around a lot longer at the dealership. One thing we noticed is that those PEV specialists drive PEVs daily. Uh, so either they're driving the demo car uh, of the dealership, uh, or say the shuttle car, uh, or they've got one themselves. It was such a great deal, they, got, they leased one themselves, for example. And consequently, they learn the ins and outs and nuances of what it's like to live with a plug-in vehicle. And they convey, one of the, one of the key learnings from this is that they're able to convey to the customer the value of this vehicle. Uh, and, and they do it in a way, kind of in sound bites, but they do it in a way that uh, captures the total monthly savings and benefits that they're going to get compared to a conventional vehicle. So for example, they might say, uh, look, you're, what's your payment now? Your payment's $250 a month on this truck you've got. Uh, with this lease, you know, we're going to get you down to $150 a $200 payment, and then you're going to get a save $150 a month. It's almost a wash, you know, that uh, you're going to save a lot of money, plus you're going to have less maintenance, you're going to get discounted rates from your utility, and the like. And they bundle all of that information together for the consumers. We also found a lot of them doing on-lot marketing, like decals, uh, the HOV decals, placing them on the car, uh, and having, you know, signs and the like, or uh, co-locating. Uh, charging stations under solar canopies and having their plug-in vehicles displayed under there and plugged in so the customer can kind of make that connection between energy efficiency and their and the and new vehicle. Um, they also target corporate university campuses with ride and drive events and special pricing. Um, and they facilitate, at least in the more, in the busier markets, they, they might facilitate home charger installation. So for example, by handing the customer off to a qualified electrician local electrician. Uh, and some of them go so far as to assist with incentive paperwork or to even, uh, you know, even do it for them uh, and pre-fill it out so that the customer only needs to sign. <clears throat> One of the things that we did uh, pick up from the California Clean Vehicle Rebate Program, uh, we put out kind of an exploratory survey here to see um, just how customers might value some of these additional services and what percentage of dealers offer these services. And as you can see here, there's uh, a good deal of interest in dealers for providing these services for plug-in buyers, um, but not a whole lot of, uh, of dealers actually doing it. Uh, but, you know, these are actually not bad numbers either, some of them anyway. Uh, for example, conf you know, configuring supporting apps. A lot of those apps might, are built into the car, for example. Uh, a good deal of them, almost half of them are doing it. And this is back again in 2013 and early 2014. So we certainly hope and we, that we'll see some of these increase over time. The other takeaway from our research is we suspect, you know, we would, we would hypothesize here that dealers may follow consumer adoption patterns. Just like we saw those dealer innovators, there's also dealer laggards. You know, the dealers who are like, I'm not doing that unless it's clear I'm going to make a lot of money off of it. Um, and this that means that before we even see these same kind of adoption characteristics from customers, we're going to need to see the, a similar type of adoption uh, characteristic from dealers. 
So ensuring dealer quality, you know, ensuring the quality of the experience means that dealer participation should be gained in sequential stages rather than, say, a shotgun approach and trying to get all of them to do certain things, you know, provide certain support or services or even sell the cars. In fact, you know, what our findings suggest that it would make a lot of sense for policymakers to target those, the biggest and the best dealers, um, and support those dealers as robustly as they possibly can. So some of the key observations, I know we're uh, getting close to the, the end here of the, uh, of the presentation, but some of the key observations we saw was PEV training and support is largely undifferentiated. Uh, there are large differences in quality amongst dealers, and there's high turnover, which can hinder Salesforce training. Liability concerns uh, can deter some dealers from marketing public incentives. We heard this quite a few times from dealers who uh, some admitted to us that they were un under instruction not to discuss public incentives because they could be liable uh, to lawsuits by customers for misrepresenting uh, the product to the customer. And that comes with a lot of uncertainty around are those incentives, well, are those incentives available? So, for example, in California, funding for some of these in incentives can run out in the middle of the year and with little warning for, uh, for dealers. Uh, and that uh, enters into it. The other is eligibility. A lot of times the dealer may not have full knowledge as to whether or not that, that customer is going to be eligible for the, uh, you know, for the incentives. The other, uh, another observation here is intra-brand price competition, which is just uh, the nature of the beast here. Um, also can deter dealers from investing in uh, you know, services that better support plug-in buyers. And the reason for this is that they could invest all this money and effort, and the customer will just go across the street to, or to uh, another, another dealer who will give the car to them you know, for 100 bucks less. Um, we also, as I think I pointed this out earlier, that sustained sales momentum feeds learning retention and swings in supply and demand can often cause this to ebb and auto in an early market where you don't have a whole lot of sales, that means that uh, some dealers uh, kind of lose touch with, uh, with what it takes to sell them. And also many utilities would be doing more if not for regulatory restrictions. Now granted, this is different from state to state. In California, it's a highly regulated market and here, utilities are specifically, at least the um, investor-owned utilities are specifically um, you know, restricted from marketing plug-in vehicles, uh, even as a product class. Uh, they also are unable to uh, install and run and operate their own charging infrastructure. And that is something that we heard a lot, especially from the plug-in plug vehicle dealers, at least the battery electric vehicle dealers, that they want to see a lot more uh, infrastructure uh, on the market. The other thing uh, that we heard, and I'm going to just kind of catalog some of the retail-friendly policies that we heard from dealers. One, they want to minimize the dealer burden. Two, is to keep the incentives coming. So we, we did, got some uh, illustrative quotes here, which I think kind of nail it. Uh, the third is to ensure certainty and amount and availability of incentives. So this is what I spoke about just a slide ago, which is that in order for the dealer to market these incentives, they've got to know when that incentive begins, when it, when it ends, and how much is it worth, and who is eligible. Else they run into some legal uh, patches here that they don't want to get their hands in. Um, four is to shift incentives to the point of purchase. This was, we heard this loud and clear. Uh, this uh, quote's also emblematic. You know, they'll take less money, but if they can get that right away, like at the point of sale, so they can put it on the window sticker, so they can offer it to the customer, there's no delay, there's no, well, are they eligible, are they going to have to wait a month or three weeks to get their check, then that's much more valuable to, um, to dealers, and they can market that, that incentive much more effectively. The other is more charging infrastructure. I mentioned that. We heard this definitely from the full battery electric vehicle um, you know, dealers, such as uh, um, you know, Nissan and Fiat dealers, for example. Um, reduce the minimum ownership period. Uh, so in California, there used to be a 36-month uh, ownership requirement in order to get the state rebate. 
That has since been eased to 30 months, which is great. That's exactly what the dealers were hoping for. In fact, I think many of them would love to see a 24-month version. They like that because it gets more traffic. It makes the, it makes the, uh, the monthly payment lower because you essentially are able to uh, have a greater amount impact the payments more, you know, over a shorter period much greatly than it would otherwise. And they get a customer that comes back in a shorter amount of time, and that's ultimately what they want. Um, the other is that dealers need the whole incentive picture. Government tools, they, you know, we heard this a lot, you know, they're fragmented. They have to go to all kinds of different sites in order to get the full picture of just what an individual customer uh, is eligible for and how much that is and whether it's available. Another thing they, they pointed out is that there's a separate sticker maybe that the government provides, you know, a standard template that, that uh, is applied at the point of the dealer, uh, then that, that would be helpful as well. The final one is to add public incentives for dealers. So this is, uh, I mentioned about the cyclicality of this uh, and building momentum and sustaining momentum. You know, uh, when the big bonus is stopped, so do sales. So if you make it worth their while, you know, they're, they're highly incentivized to, uh, to become an expert on the car. They know they're going to make money on it. So our findings point to a dual path approach here to close the retail quality gap. The first big one here is to accommodate alternative retail models. Roughly half the U.S. states currently either ban or restrict Tesla's uh, retail model, um, which is a direct to consumer retail model. Many of you are probably already familiar with that, so I won't delve into it. I'll entertain any questions if you have them uh, once I'm done here. But what's important is that that to recognize is that that is an innovation-specific strategy, and it serves the purpose of that automaker in order to build brand loyalty and to ensure that those customers are happy with that technology and want to buy it again. Recognizing, however, that when we talk about accommodating alternatives, we still need to protect consumers. And many of the uh, laws and consumer protections that have been instituted over the many decades are to, are to protect, are there for a reason, to protect the customer whether, regardless of who sells the car to them, whether that's a dealer or an automaker, so those definitely need to be preserved. The second big piece here is to institute retail-friendly policies and incentives. And that just means, you know, have, putting that lens, you know, crafting policies that check against the retail friendliness of these policies. So first is trying to you know, emphasize those that, that can be offered at the point of purchase. A sales tax exemption, for, for example, is a great one because there's no question, there, there's few questions involved in that. Dealers can very quickly compute how much that is and when it can be offered to the, deal, to the customer. The other is to, is to reserve uh, those benefits in advance. So upon, for example, taking inventory from the automaker. Um, we in California, this wasn't the case initially, but automakers and dealers and the DMV, the Department of Motor Vehicles, work together to streamline that process to make HOV details available when the dealer takes inventory from the automaker. The same might be tried with rebate funds. And consequently, the automaker can capitalize on marketing that benefit if, they, if that can be achieved. The other is to use a targeted approach toward dealers. As I mentioned earlier, and that means focusing on those early adopters, uh, innovators, those the innovator dealers, the ones who really want to do this and see it as, as a strategic opportunity. You know, engage the biggest ones and provide them with a robust package support that can include stakeholders such as utilities, uh, that can include uh, user groups, such as the, electric, the local electric automobile association, who will often work with dealers to bring in leads, um, and engaging those stakeholders to help create an ecosystem. The other that I would point out here too is to give them tools that these that dealers can use. We talk about the fragmented nature of the consumer tools uh, about incentives, you know, for finding what kind of incentives they're available for. Dealers need the same tools, and they need to be able to see the same thing that consumers are looking at. So what they need is uh, a packaged, you know, uh, tool set of all the data, and that includes not just fuel economy, but also the utility rates, 
also all of the equipment benefits and things like that that might be uh, uh, brought in. So to recap, uh, industry is currently leveraging, by and large, mass market channels. Recently, there, there have been some exceptions to that, and which is good to see. BMW, for example, has launched their iSub brand, which is a way to, uh, it's a form of a niche strategy uh, in order to kind of better control uh, the experience that a customer has when they buy this technology. Um, now these are great, as we mentioned, the mass market channels are accessing mainstream customers but they're less so at reaching early customers and stoking demand. Um, so we need to encourage more of that. Um, what we heard a lot too was that there's what's called channel conflict, and that's on steroids. Oh, well, this actually came from the automaker. They, automakers often have issues when they introduce a new technology because it, it, dealers are very process-based. So they have to train all their dealers. They usually they have a sales force to do that to train all their dealers on, hey, this is how you pair the phone, pair your phone, mobile phone with the car. This is something that would be literally on steroids because it introduces so many different changes that it can be overwhelming to dealers and for automakers to try to train up dealers to do that. Um, so alternative approaches are needed to close this gap. We already mentioned more retail-friendly policies and incentives are needed. Dealer participation should be gained in stages, and dealers need package support, and stakeholders can play an enlarged role in that effort. And with that, I conclude the presentation. We'll be happy to entertain any questions or comments you might have. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, and that was uh, really excellent, and uh, I'm sure there will be many questions. I think we have a few um, in the chat box. I'm going to invite all the uh, attendees to jump in with questions as, uh, as they, they come to mind. But let me, I mean, I have already uh, a few of my own, so if you don't mind, Eric, I can uh, shoot the first question. Sure. Um, so I think uh, just for clarity, you know, when you talk about uh, you know customer satisfaction, and you talk about people who buy uh, PVs versus people who buy conventional vehicles, the question I have is, do people walk into the dealership knowing what they want in general, um, or is there a significant role in the dealership to convince people, uh, you know, whether they're conventional or whether they're PV? I mean, well, what's that dynamic? Sure, and great question. The way dealers, as I mentioned in the presentation, dealers are optimized to facilitate the sale. That presumes that the customer already pretty much has a good idea of what they want to buy. And that's largely the case. About 90%, the typical industry average, about 90% of customers who walk on the lot already know what they want to buy. Now, we did take a look at the difference between plug-in buyers and, and conventional buyers, and it's a little higher. But, you know, that's kind of the industry, industry standard. I'd say it's also a uh, you know feature of the early market, and that plug-in buyers are generally been waiting. There's a lot of pent-up demand, so consequently, there's more people going to know what they want to buy in advance. Mm. That's one issue. The issue is really then educating them, right, about what is involved in ensuring that they're going to be able to capture the full value and benefits of their experience with that brand new technology. And that's where some of these alternative strategies can be helpful. Hmm. So let me, I mean, that's very important, I think, for policy potentially. So uh, let me dig a little deeper there. So uh, let's take as an example anybody, like Toyota, any, any car, uh, OEM. Uh, so somebody comes into the dealership and uh, he's thinking Toyota has only, for now, only one or two models, uh, plug-in models. He has the Prius and the RAV4. Um, so, you know, if somebody walks in already with the idea of buying uh, a plug-in vehicle, what is the added value of having an HOV sticker, for example, if that person already knows that he or she wants a, a plug-in vehicle? Because they uh, get it that day and can drive on the HOV lane the moment they drive off that lot. Mm. And that's huge for dealers. It's huge for customers because a lot of customers are like, they, by the time they want to buy a car, they're like, they're, it, it attracts commuters. That's one of the segments that the, or at least the initial plugins are attracting are commuters, and these are people who don't want to wait. They don't want to wait four weeks and be stuck in traffic. They just spent a lot of money. Uh, they're taking a, a chance on this car. They want to drive off the lot and be able to go immediately use that HOV lane. For dealers, that's wonderful because they want to make the sale today. What can they do to put you in this car today? So that HOV lane gives them instant, the customer gets instant benefit, and therefore the dealer can say, look, you're going to be able to drive on the HOV lane right this you know, the moment 
drive off this lot. Have fun. Good. <laughs> Any questions, Connie? Yes, we have one from Elaine O'Grady. What is a typical SPIS for non-TEVs? So SPIS can run, and they typically run, and that's a, a sorry, that's a, to back up a little, SPIF or SPIF is, is basically a, um, a variable bonus for the salesperson who is selling the car, who sold the car. So uh, it can run anywhere from, usually from 150, 200 bucks to $1,000. Um, in some cases, it can actually run higher than that, but it's, it's fairly rare. Um, so it just depends. And a SPIF is kind of like, there's different ways of doing it, um, but it's usually kind of like a roulette wheel. They hit a button on the computer and <laughs> it tells them, hey, you just got 250 bucks, or you just got $1,000 for selling that, that vehicle. And so maybe that appeals to the gambler and every dealer. I don't, who knows? Our next question is from Mark Simon. What is the range of incentive that would motivate a dealer? And a similar question from Ryan McCarthy. Yeah. Is if we want to incentivize dealers and salespeople, would, would be an appropriate amount of level incentive for each? Yeah, great question. What we find for salespeople is it's usually going to have to be a three-digit three figure, uh, preferably a couple, at least a couple hundred dollars in addition to whatever spiff they're getting from the, uh, say, from the automaker. Um, and that's just the salesperson. To get the dealer to stock it is the next is the next hurdle, and that means you're going to need at least a few hundred more dollars on top of that to entice the dealer principal to actually stock the inventory. So, given that, I'd say it's probably somewhere between a total of 500 and 1,000 dollars. If you want to, you don't want to go too high. In fact, I'd argue toward keeping it on the lower end of that because you don't want dealers, uh, at least within traditional channels here, you know, mass market channels, pushing the customers who are a poor fit for the technology into the car so they can make it make a buck, and that's um, that's something that should concern everybody. Other questions, Connie? Um, not any more, or not any right now in the chat. Please keep them coming. We welcome all discussion. Do you have any more? Yeah, yet? so I'll continue because I have a, a list here. <coughs> um, so I think you mentioned at some point uh, kind of the, the turnover of uh, the salesmen, uh, people staying in their job for like a 12 months or so, or it's like a short-term employment yeah. sometimes. So I wonder if uh, there's a difference that you notice on the attitude towards PEVs between the ownership of the dealership versus the salespeople. In other words, are the owners perhaps more um, you know, sold in the idea of the long-term uh, value of PVs versus the uh, shorter-term salespeople. And I'm thinking this because, you know, when you mentioned that, you know, PVs tend to be a hassle, yeah. I wonder, you know, if they are so, why do they get them in the first place? I mean, how is the dynamic playing there? Yes. Um, some of it is because they are kind of taking a tentative position. You know, they're a bit more risk-averse. Uh, and they don't, they're kind of maybe taking a fast follower kind of position on it as opposed to a more leadership role in introducing the technology. They don't want to be left or caught flat footed if for some reason they're, you know, the, the dealer, the nearest dealer they compete with suddenly starts selling these things off, the, you know, uh, selling a ton of these things and start siphoning customers away from their dealership. So that's part of it. Did that answer your question or was there a second part to that? I think that's, uh, I think that's most of it. Um, um, yeah, that, that, I think uh, that, that um, makes sense. Um, so, there's, I, I should mention and, and really emphasize that there's, yeah. a, there's a real danger. I mean, many automakers, in order to achieve, achieve scale, they are they're really trying hard to push this out to as many dealers within a given market area as possible. Now, automakers are, are limited in a number of ways. But one thing they've done with this technology is kind of a, the best they can do in terms of a modified version of that niche strategy. And we see different gradations of that. So, for example, Nissan and many others have limited the market. You know, they, it's only offered in certain markets in California or in Texas mm -hmm. or wherever else, or <coughs> Tennessee and other states. Um, and that's a way of kind of better controlling the experience. Others have chosen to use a sub-branding method, like BMW, for example, right. with their ISO brand. Um, 
So these are these are different forms of trying to control the experience. One of the, the cautionary tale here is in trying to get as many dealers, I know policymakers, how do we get more dealers to sell these things? That may be the wrong question. Mm. It's not how many more dealers that are selling it. It's what is the right number of dealers to be selling it? And how can we ensure that they're delivering a good experience for this right. technology? And that really should be the focus that, uh, that policymakers take on this. Mm. Interesting. Uh, I wonder if you can go back to one of the slides. Uh, there was one with uh, horizontal bars with multiple colors that uh, was a little busy but quite interesting to me. <coughs> uh, in terms of the differences in the time it took to sell a, a, a bit oh, for the back. Uh, yeah. that, so that one there. So um, on the question of time it takes to sell a car for a given dealership, uh, conventional versus uh, a plug-in vehicle, I just assume, and I wonder what you think about this, that uh, the, the extra time it will take to sell a PV compared to a conventional car mm -hmm. would decrease with a number of factors. One, potentially the experience or, or you know, you know the, the, the time that this has been in the market and the experience of the dealerships and the, the salespeople. Uh, and also with the consumer being more familiar with the PVs in the first place. Yeah. So do you see this time gap being decreasing over time? Yeah, I would certainly hope we see that that gap shrink over time. Where I could see that not happening is in prematurely trying to get this technology pushed out to, the, say, like that shotgun method to as many dealerships as possible. And consequently, if people who have a bad experience with this technology or don't get their HOV lane decal right. or their $2,000 rebate or get the tax credit they thought they were going to get and end up being really... Uh, you know, turned off to the technology. Mm -hmm. And what's important about that early market is word of mouth dynamics are critical uh, to the success of the new technology. And that's one of the reasons Tesla is doing what it's doing, even BMW with its ISO brand strategy, is to tightly control that the word of mouth and the messages that are introduced into that uh, into that segment. So that's how I could, I certainly see a risk for this market in, you know, sales could collapse in the event that people have a bad experience and they tell all their friends, you know. Right, right. Uh, so this is an sensitive market, there's no question about it. And in fact, one of the things that I would suggest, and we've seen work, is like I mentioned designating the PEV specialist. It's a great way for more traditional automakers to scale with demand and to ensure that they're going to have a good experience. So mm -hmm. instead of training your, the entire sales pool, in which case at any one time you're only selling five cars a month, you're only going to, you know, any one of those salespeople might only sell one car a month. Right. But if you're selling all five and it's just that one salesperson, then at least they're getting more frequent exposure and they're retaining, more able to retain that learning. And then as demand increases, you add another specialist. Yeah, that makes sense. More questions? Yes. We have one from Ryan McCarthy. Aside from Tesla, did you notice a significant difference among dealers affiliated with an automaker that is currently committed to PEVs, for example, GM or Nissan? Right, that's a great question, Ryan. We didn't break the data in that respect, um, so I can. So the answer is no. I don't have that. Uh, that would be, I'd say, a, a great. Uh, a great research topic for, say, the next researcher to come along <laughs> and, and, and try to get the 2014 data, and I think there would be sufficient uh, amount of data uh, and sample size here to do that kind of analysis. We have another question from Jamie Knapp. Claire, can you please clarify the reference to SPIF being like a roulette wheel? Do the salespeople really not know in advance how much of a SPIF they will get? And is this consistent across all brands and models, PEV or not? Um, so the answer is yes to the first part of that question. The second part of that question is it's a fairly standard industry tool regardless of the technology. It's, uh, it, but it, uh, some automakers use it, some don't. Some have a fixed bonus. Um, there's also there's big differences in incentive structure. So some, in some cases, some dealers have, uh, are not working on commission. Their salespeople don't work on commission. They work on a flat fee. Um, you know, a flat commission. Mm -hmm. So that is a, a different beast altogether. We definitely find that a flat commission would work better for this type of technology than, say, a percentage-based commission, which for obvious reasons. 
Are there any more questions? I have one. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I'm going to talk to the, the other one, so we have to uh, wrap up, but let me let me shoot you uh, probably the more uh, controversial question, uh, maybe you saw it coming already knowing uh, some of our early conversations, Eric. Uh, so even looking at this very uh, slide here, so uh, you described the last row as a plug-in buyer premium, but that basically is a Tesla model. Yes, only. 2013 it's Tesla. Right, so, uh, that, that, uh, so one can help by to um, kind of think it's not just the, the type of car, but also the type of model that company uses yeah. to sell their cars. It's even yeah, uh, franchise approach and so on. Slide, I think. Let me double check. Sorry, not that slide. It would be this slide. Right. And slide nine. That's exactly right. That's that's essentially the model here. And we're matching up the type of innovation with the introduction strategy and having a look at performance. And in in Later years here, we definitely want to do what Ryan suggested and see what, you know, now that we have more brand and a right. larger sample right. size, we can see whether it's going to be a better, better affirm whether this yeah. introduction strategy innovation relationship is, is really strong or not. That's right. So, uh, it is. so when you talk about disruptive innovation, usually that involves in some level some kind of a different paradigm, and if not that, a different model sometimes. So you talked about, you know, of course, the Tesla approach, but also you mentioned the, uh, the i brand in BMW, which is right. one step towards kind of a different brand within the company. Right, and it's, a, it's, a differ, it's differentiating the experience. Yeah. And even with conventional dealers who are selling plug-in, you know, it's established dealers who are selling plug-in buyers, we heard this a lot, that buying a plug-in is like a, li it's a lifestyle. Mm. And that's what actually serves the luxury market fairly well, because people buy those cars um, you know, generally are looking for certain lifestyle values, right? right? And they're going to be more affluent and wealthy. And that's something we, as policymakers, have a hard time with, I think, because we're always interested in, in you know, um, uh, you know, uh, equanimity here. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, low income versus high income and who are we actually incenting. But the reality here is that when it comes to technology adoption, and this is fundamentally a technology adoption problem, you have to rely on those early, more affluent, more educated buyers to buy down this technology for everybody else. That's part of the process. Circumventing that can create issues. So, for example, a lot of you know, people who buy, say, uh, uh, their next car are influenced by what does their neighbor have, but do they aspire to be like their neighbor? And that's the real question. You know, what is an aspirational? You know, what makes a car aspirational versus a car that you know somebody, right. you know, somebody they not not don't necessarily aspire to be has. So that's that's the unfortunate uh, paradox with these technologies. We'd love to make them available to the mass market to every income level, but the reality is that to introduce these successfully and to accelerate that that adoption process, it's best to leverage the process in terms of how it works, which is um, from the top down. Hmm. Okay, well that's a very good closing line. Uh, it's already uh, exactly 11 uh, on the West Coast, uh, it's 2 p.m. on the East Coast. Uh, thank you again, Eric, that was an excellent presentation, thank you very much. Thank you to everybody who joined uh, the, the webinar. Feel free to uh, shoot Eric any questions. Uh, I think uh, he showed uh, an email they can reach you at. Yes. Uh, and also, you should know that we'll be posting the webinar as we do always, uh, the recording on our web, uh, website, uh, zeroemissionmap.ucdavis.edu. So with that, thank you all, and I adjourn the webinar. Thank you.